Hello, everyone, and welcome to Van City's 76th Annual General Meeting. My name is Anita Braha, and I am the chair of Van City's Board of Directors and will be chairing tonight's Annual General Meeting. We are once again hosting our AGM virtually, as we have for the past two years. Obviously, it would have been much nicer to gather together in person, as we've done in the past. Meeting virtually loses the warmth and the connection we would normally get to experience. But it also makes it easier for more of us to attend. You know, in the past two years, we've had over 600 members join each meeting, and we've been delighted to have you engage with us through your questions and participate even from afar. This year, we have the board here with us, along with our executive management team, who is attending the meeting on site. So while we'll miss the chance to connect with you in person, we're glad that so many of you can attend this meeting virtually as we report to you on our latest results from last year and where we plan to go this year. We have a full presentation tonight with information on Van City's performance, activities, and future plans. So please stay tuned until the end as we need 100 members for this meeting to be duly convened. If you haven't already done so, please make sure to access tonight's AGM package located on the main page at www.vancity.com slash AGM. I now call this meeting to order. Thank you. I will begin by acknowledging that I'm speaking to you today from the traditional, ancestral, unceded territory of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh people. While we meet today on a virtual platform, I would like to acknowledge the Indigenous peoples of all the lands that we are on. We do this to acknowledge and appreciate the land itself, the people who have stewarded it for generations, and how we all benefit from these lands and those people. We also reaffirm our commitment and responsibility to improve relationships between nations, as well as improving our own understanding of local Indigenous peoples and their cultures. Before we begin, I would like to play a video from Chief Leanne Joe, who has kindly agreed to record a welcome blessing for those of us gathered here at the Rocky Mountaineer Station on Squamish territory. Welcome to the 2022 Van City AGM. My name is Shapela Matsyam, also known as Chief Leanne Joe. I am one of 16 hereditary chiefs of the Squamish Nation. I am also the first female chief of my family. I come from the Lackett Joe family. I was born and raised in Oslohan. I am also a descendant of the Wilson and Frank families, uh, the Kwakwakiwak speaking people on the East Coast shores of Vancouver Island. I also come from the Thomas family uh, from the Tsleil-Waututh Nation. I want to welcome you to the unceded traditional territories of the Skoltmish, Musqueam and Tsleil-Waututh communities where each of you work, live and play uh, within the Van City area. I want to welcome you to the AGM, um, welcome the Board of Directors and all of the members. I too am a Van City uh, Bank member and I look forward to the discussion ahead of us today and for all the following days to come in the 2022 year. And I hope that um, you're influencing how we as Indigenous communities are reconciling with financial institutions um, for the greater well-being of all of our children and people yet to be. OCM, take care and have a great day. Thank you, Chief Leanne Joe, for recording this welcome blessing for us. It's important for us to acknowledge the Indigenous peoples on whose traditional territories we live and work. It's a critical sign of respect that recognizes their presence both in the past and today, and it's one small way that we can express our commitment to reconciliation. I now would like to introduce our Board of Directors. I do want to acknowledge that one of our directors, Megan Giltro, was not able to join us today as she is on a short leave to manage a personal matter, but is following along virtually with the rest of you. 
Rita Parikh, our vice chair, who unfortunately is also unavailable to be with us here tonight due to an unavoidable conflict, but along with Megan has joined us virtually. Hello to both of you watching. Now let me introduce the directors with me here this evening. To my left, we have Bill Chan, Joel DeYoung, Lily Grewal, and to my right, we've got Patrick Nangle and Christy Stevenson. And a very warm welcome to our newly elected director, Kristen Rivers. I and the board look forward to working with you, Kristen. I'd also like to introduce you to our executive leadership team. Christine Bergeron, president and CEO, who is here with me. You'll be hearing from her shortly. The rest of the team are joining us this evening, uh, and they are as follows. Janelle Acker, Chief Equity and People Officer. Nez Aquino, Chief Risk Officer. Clayton Buckingham, Chief Financial Officer. Jonathan Fowley, Chief External Relations Officer. Dave Perry, Chief Member Services Officer. Kirsten Sutton, Chief Technology and Information Officer. Van City has duly appointed Deborah Finley as parliamentarian who has joined us here tonight in person. Welcome, Deborah. And a special welcome to our American Sign Language interpreters. You will see them at the bottom of your screens during tonight's meeting. The notice of the AGM was sent before April 23rd, 2022, meeting the 18-day minimum notice requirement. The Van City rules state that a quorum for general meetings is 100 members. And we have 112 people participating in our webcast tonight. So we've met quorum. Thank you all for turning in this evening, for tuning in this evening, I should say. I would now like to go over a few housekeeping items for tonight's meeting. You can submit questions and comments at any point during tonight's meeting. To do this, please click on the highlighted icon shown in the presentation. We will do our best to address most questions during the question period, but if we don't get to your question tonight, we'll collect all questions, and in the days after the meeting, we're going to post responses based on the themes of the most frequently asked questions on vancity.com. Please use the highlighted icon function when you'd like to move or second a motion. At the AGM this evening, we'll be answering questions related to our strategy, our financial performance, member services, and other thematic issues that matter to you. If you have a specific question related to your own financial accounts, please email us at agm at vancity.com and we'll make sure your question gets to the right department. I now go over our voting process for tonight's resolutions. Once I read out a resolution, I will ask that you click on the messaging icon if you'd like to move or second a motion. Once it's time to vote, you will see the motion you are voting on with three buttons, for, against, and withheld. When you wish to vote in favor of a resolution, press for. If you're opposed to a resolution, press against. And if you wish to abstain, as in not vote, press withheld. To close the count, we will want all members to respond, so please make sure you are following along and voting. You'll have up to 30 seconds to vote, and once the votes are tabulated, they will be displayed on the screen. Please put your vote in when prompted to do so, and be patient as we wait for the results to come in. Please ensure that you're watching this webcast live as it will impact the time that you have to vote. Make sure you see the live indicator at the bottom left corner of the video player window and see that it has a red circle next to it. If the circle's gray, you are watching a delayed broadcast. By pressing the live indicator, you will jump to the live feed. Once you hit the live button, the circle will change from gray to red and you'll be watching the live stream in real time. This avoids the voting window from closing too early. 
Now we'll move on to the first motion of the night. You should have a copy of the eight agenda in your package posted online, and we've also placed the agenda on the screens for your convenience. The first motion of the night is to approve the agenda. Remember, please type in the chat if you'd like to move or second a motion. So the question is, should the agenda be approved? Is there a motion that the agenda be approved with a closing time for the meeting of 7.45 p.m.? Is there a mover for the motion? Please make sure you enter your, um, your motion in the chat function. Yes, we have a mover. Thank you, Jeffrey Holm. Is there a seconder? Thank you, Ali Punjani. It is moved and seconded. Is there any discussion? I'm gonna give you a few seconds here to type in whether there's any discussion. I'm being informed that there's no discussion taking place online. So I'm gonna ask you to please vote now. So we're waiting for the results and the results to whether the agenda should be approved is carried. The motion is carried. Now the standing rules are part of your AGM package right after the agenda. Let me draw your attention to the following standing rules. Rule number two, members may submit a question or comment electronically. Such questions, if recognized by the chair, will be addressed at the meeting. Rule number five, members may submit questions or comments throughout the meeting. They will be addressed during the allotted question period. Please keep your questions and comments brief and to the point. Rule number six, a second question or comment on the same motion will be addressed if there's enough time left during the allotted question period. Rule number seven, the AGM is for the purpose of transacting the business of the general membership of Vancouver City Savings Credit Union. Issues of a personal nature will not be addressed during the meeting, but may be referred to an appropriate employee. The standing rules require approval by a simple majority. So is there a motion that the proposed standing rules for the 76th AGM be approved? Please message us through clicking on the messaging icon if you'd like to move or second this motion. Is there a mover? Uh, is there a mover uh, for the motion? Please type in the chat now if you'd like to move that motion. So we're waiting for one of our members online to move that motion, to accept the standing rules. May we please have a mover? Thank you, Oksana. And is there a seconder? 
Thank you. Craig. So it's moved and seconded. Is there any discussion on this motion? Again, we'll give you a few seconds to type. I'm being informed that there is no discussion taking place online. So the question is, should the standing rules for the 76th annual general meeting be approved? Please vote now. Pigeon Park Savings is a low barrier, community oriented credit union. For a lot of people, Pigeon Park is the last option in banking and check cashing. Folks who often can't access uh, banking services elsewhere or have been left out of financial services who feel that they're inaccessible. There are a lot of resources that are needed by folks that can't access them in other ways. So we help our members access basic financial literacy, cashing your check, getting a bank card. If it wasn't for them, a lot of people would not be able to get their welfare checks or their CPP checks. There's no other bank in the downtown east side that gives you that type of respect and gratitude. It's a welcoming atmosphere, like there's no judgment from anyone. They bend over backwards for me and I just, I appreciate it more than I can say. To be able to come in here, get an account and have a bank card, it, it, it really helps a lot of people. I see it in their faces, I see it in the way they act. During COVID, they have been there for the neighborhood. They've been there for me. Thank you for voting. Waiting for the results to show up on the monitor. And that motion is carried. The board approved the minutes of the 2021 meeting and a copy has also been included in the annual general meeting package. One of the traditions of our annual general meetings has been to recognize those of our members who have been with our credit union for 50 years or longer. With hundreds of us gathered in the same room, we always have several people who stand up to identify their long history with us. And we don't want to abandon that tradition, even though we are not seeing all of you in person tonight. So we encourage anyone who has been a member since 1972 or earlier to send us a message. You can do so by clicking on the questions and comments icon at the top of your screens. We'll be sure to share them with everyone. I know we've got many members who can proudly attest to half a century with Van City, and we do want to acknowledge their continued support. Now, I'm happy to present the Board of Directors report. You know, there are fancy ways of explaining what it means to be a member of a cooperative, but it really comes down to a simple thing. We face big challenges together. We help each other. We get through the storm together and we leave no one behind. That's particularly relevant today. The climate emergency is getting worse. COVID is still around us. Housing is still not affordable for many. And too many in our communities continue to face economic inequality and racism. Facing these challenges alone can feel hopeless but we don't have to face them alone. 2021 was a very successful year financially for Van City. But when the board looked back at 2021, what really stood out for us was how Van City stepped up for members and communities. We didn't turn people away during these difficult times. Instead, we asked, how can we help? And we provided solutions. For example, we proactively reached out to members who might have been affected by flooding and helped facilitate access to cash or credit if needed. We deployed our humanitarian fund to help communities affected by flooding or forest fires, including several indigenous communities that were particularly hard hit. And we've been working with governments, 
settlement agencies, and other community partners to address the needs of displaced Ukrainians who are arriving in BC. And we also stepped up for members by looking at the big challenges you face and asking ourselves, what more can we do to address them? As a cooperative, we recognize that the impact of COVID has intersected with both economic inequality and the effects of systemic racism, oppression, and colonialism. And we know that we must stand together against all forms of social and economic exclusion. Everyone must have the same opportunities to succeed. It's unacceptable that people continue to face systemic racism and discrimination. And one of the board's goals is to become a proactively anti-racist governing body. Doing more to remove systemic barriers is an ongoing board priority, especially important when those barriers affect people's financial well-being. 2021 further reminded everyone why reconciliation is a core Van City value. The board knows true reconciliation starts with meaningful engagement, listening, and respectful collaboration. Van City continues to work proactively to deepen and broaden our partnerships and relationships with Indigenous communities. We stand by Indigenous communities in the journey of grieving, healing, and honoring the children that never came home from residential schools. We've partnered with the Indigenous Peoples Fund to distribute support when and where it's needed most. The Indigenous Peoples Fund is 100% Indigenous-led and has deep knowledge of Indigenous communities in BC. The board also continued on its own path of learning. In September of 2021, we learned about Indigenous principles of value, wealth, and well-being from Dr. Dara Kelly. We plan further director education on Indigenous topics for 2022. Man City's climate commitments announced in 2021 are another top priority for the board in addressing a systemic challenge that intersects with existing inequalities. That's why the board has set as one of its goals to approve climate risk goals and metrics and a net zero emission transition plan. As a cooperative, we've long known that while the climate crisis will affect us all, those already facing economic and systemic barriers will fare worse. The board is focused on ensuring that our credit union helps those who might struggle to respond to the climate crisis on their own. Helping those who might otherwise be left behind is another way cooperatives make a difference. All this work is making a big difference and it's our employees who are making it happen. The health and safety of our employees is paramount for the board. We're committed to ensuring that employees have a safe environment in which to deliver an essential service to members. And we're committed to helping our employees deal with the same challenges so many of us have been facing outside of work. In 2021, following an extensive hiring process, we appointed Christine Bergeron as our permanent president and CEO. Christine has been instrumental in leading our work while navigating a challenging external reality. The board looks forward to working with Christine and the rest of the leadership group to advance our transformational vision and to continue being there for our members and communities when they need us. Since our founding 75 years ago, Van City has worked to increase financial opportunity, remove economic barriers, and address systemic challenges affecting our members. This past year, the board approved a new vision statement for Van City. It's a vision that fully captures our hopes and our aspirations and which will guide our work into the future. Our vision is a transformed economy that protects the earth and guarantees equity for all. The challenges we face today may be more complex than they used to be, but our commitment to helping solve them is steadfast. We know that together with our members, we can bring this vision to life. And now I'd like to take a moment to acknowledge the board's previous chair, Jan O'Brien for receiving the CCUA 2021 Distinguished Credit Union Leader Award. Jan has demonstrated outstanding leadership in the credit union and financial services sector over many years and in multiple roles. Van City in particular has had the privilege and benefit of Jan's leadership on the Van City Board over the past 12 years, 
including four years as chair. Jan always translated her dedication to cooperative values and her deep commitment to social justice, labor rights, financial inclusion, and equality into her leadership. She always served with strength, commitment, and proven impact. Her leadership and mentorship have resounded throughout our board and our organization. We couldn't be more proud that Jan's leadership has now been acknowledged by the broader credit union movement in Canada. I also want to acknowledge and thank Javeria Veltkamp for her important work at the board this past year. Javeria served on the audit, governance, risk, and technology committees and is leaving to take up a senior role at NBC. Her passion for climate action and achieving a clean and fair world stood out throughout her year on the board and she will be missed. The entire board wishes Javeria good luck in her new role. And now I'll turn it over to Christine for the CEO's report. Great, thank you, Anita. Good evening. I've always been so proud to be a member of the Van City team. And in 2021, that pride strengthened as we responded to another challenging year. As a team, we stayed true to our values and focused on what matters most, our members, the communities we serve, each other, and the planet that nurtures us all. Most important was to stand by our members through the turbulence. Our teams continued to serve members' banking needs through the thick and thin of the pandemic. We helped member businesses get through the impact of health restrictions and supply chain delays. We helped members and communities impacted by the climate crisis like the wildfires in Kamloops, extreme heat across BC, or flooding in Abbotsford. We've enhanced account security and how we advise our members and understand their needs. I think this deep desire to help our members was one key reason that we had such strong financial results this year. We finished 2021 with operating earnings of $156.1 million. This was 35% above our target for the year. We had a very strong year in terms of growth in our loans and in the money members invest with us, our wealth management inflows. Our total assets plus assets under administration grew in 2021 from $30.5 billion to $33.2 billion. And nearly 90% of those loans are funded by deposits from our members. This shows what a strong foundation our members provide for us to continue to invest in activities to drive positive change. The best part of our success in 2021 is actually what it means for the value and the impact we deliver for members and communities. The return we deliver on an average member's equity grew significantly this year. We delivered a 9.3% return overall and a 7% return once we account for shared success payouts. Our triple bottom line assets and assets under administration are now $10.7 billion. That's over 75% more than what it was in 2017 and well above our 9.1 billion target for 2021. And our shared success payout was $31.9 million this year. This is the amount that we pay out to members and communities every year from our net profits. And it was our highest ever in 2021. Sharing 30% of our annual net profit makes Van City unique among financial institutions. We know that we are only as strong as the communities around us. I believe our financial success is a sign of the trust that you put in us. This is reflected in the data we see about how satisfied members are after interacting with our team, whether at community branches, over the phone, or through our call center. It's also reflected in our membership growth. We increased our membership by nearly 10,000 in 2021. This net growth of 1.75% was well above our 2021 target as well. We continue strengthening member service and experience wherever we can. And we continue to work hard on this, especially when it comes to delivering on our ongoing strategy to improve our digital banking experience. Another key driver of our financial results is a considerable community impact we've been able to deliver during a time when the world is facing severe challenges. Throughout our 75 years, Van City has been committed to addressing systemic challenges and barriers faced by our members and communities. And events in recent years reinforce why we must continue to be a financial force for change. In January 2021, we launched our climate commitments, pledging to do more to address the ongoing climate emergency. 
we are working to bring our financed emissions to net zero by 2040, a more ambitious timeline than most other major financial institutions in Canada. We are offering only responsible investment options that have strong ESG, environmental, social governance, screening, and stewardship. We are working to support our members and communities through the transition to a clean and fair economy, starting with the refresh of our planet-wise, climate-focused financial products. In 2021, we also released the first comprehensive accounting of our financed emissions. This accounting gave us a starting point to create credible interim targets for reducing emissions. We'll be releasing these targets later this year. We've always worked to remove the barriers and legacies that systemic racism creates. Last year, I reported that Van City also committed to become an actively anti-racist organization that challenges racism in all its forms around us and internally. As part of this journey, we initiated an external audit to look at ways we can advance racial equity for employees, members, and communities. We are implementing recommendations from this audit. And we continue to tailor loans and investments to underserved groups, including Black, Indigenous, and women entrepreneurs. We are also deepening our work to better serve the needs of our Indigenous partners. We invested over 1.3 million of our shared success community funds in initiatives designed to support Indigenous communities in areas such as housing, employment, and entrepreneurship. We worked with elders and community members to indigenize and decolonize our Each One Teach One financial literacy curriculum. The new curriculum is centered on an Indigenous definition of wealth and learning. We'll be rolling it out to communities in the coming months. We also signed on to the Progressive Aboriginal Relations Certification Program. This is a standardized certification program run by the Canadian Council for Aboriginal Business. It will help guide leadership actions and actions we take on employment, business development, and community relationships. It will help us to identify impactful opportunities, to hold ourselves accountable, and to ensure our reconciliation action is rooted in community. This work builds on years of previous work to embed reconciliation as a core Van City value. Our community investment work is a key tool for delivering on our vision of a transformed economy that protects the earth and guarantees equity for all. From community branch grants to large scale multi-year partnerships serving multiple communities, our community investment work is integral to how Van City and our members are a financial force for change. This work continued in full force in 2021. We funded many organizations and initiatives that are removing barriers and driving change in areas ranging from affordable housing to the circular economy and climate equity. We are enhancing this work with particular focus on our commitment to a just climate transition. We continue to be leaders on how to achieve sustainable and inclusive growth and build a clean and fair world. And our leadership in thought and action has been recognized within the credit union system at all levels of government and globally. Our thought leadership builds on our cooperative model and decades of experience working to achieve greater financial inclusion and equity. The world is finally taking notice of a model that we have espoused for many years. And as a result, we represent a clear, relevant and sought after voice speaking on behalf of people and planet. How we serve members is a big part of what makes us different. I've mentioned various drivers for our great 2021 results. Our members, our desire to help you and the trust you put in us, our community impact, both at the local community level and in focusing on system change. But the key to it all is the amazing Van City team who met the year's challenges with determination and so much heart every single day. I truly believe they're what sets us apart. So the team, to the team, a big thank you for all that you do. I was delighted that we saw high employee engagement results and were ranked as the top local employer in a Georgia Straits readers poll. Not every year we'll see such strong outcomes. And there were some unique factors in 2021 that contributed to some of our financial results. As such, we certainly expect ups and downs in 2022 and beyond, especially given the uncertainty facing the economy today. The financial performance targets we set for this year reflect this. These targets are both cautious and optimistic. 
not as high as what we achieved in 2021, but more ambitious than our historical trends before that. They reflect that while we are aware that some things that happened in 2021 won't continue, much of our success in 2021 was due to our strategy working. The data we're seeing makes us believe strongly in our fundamentals and in our unique triple bottom line cooperative business model. Our member focus and impact work, our employees' patience and compassion, and our commitment to staying true to our values and pursuing our vision remain constant. They will continue to propel us forward. I'm inspired by our organization, the work we did, and our successes achieved. Thank you. Thank you, Christine. We'll now take a short pause and continue with the question period right after this. My name is Jolene Mitten. I am Cree from the Sawbridge Nation. I am born and raised in East Van, and my title would be producer, friend, mentor, uh, basketball coach. And I'm the founder of Vancouver Indigenous Fashion Week, Supernaturals, and everything else. <laughs> okay. the community is huge and that's something that I, I do in my work with Vancouver Indigenous Fashion Week and Supernaturals and the basketball team. What's really important to me is seeing representation on all levels. Working within a community that I love and want to see thrive is amazing and beautiful and I couldn't picture my life uh, without it. We've got to do more to save the climate and to improve our environment. In the next 25 years, 10% of the global food mass should come from seaweed. Cascadia seaweed is growing to be the largest ocean cultivator of seaweed in North America. And as the seaweed sector grows, it produces very positive uh, ecosystem services. It sequesters carbon, it uptakes excess nutrients, it reduces acidification, and it creates habitat for things that live in the ocean. Seaweed can have a positive economic and environmental impact. At Love the Grub, we take bumped, bruised, misshapen fruits and vegetables um, in an effort to avoid them from going into the landfill, and we turn them into chutneys and spreads um, to sell for the local market. I wanted to also make an impact on the socioeconomic side of things, and I uh, hire newcomer refugees because my mom is a refugee, my partner is a refugee, and I really wanted to give back to that community. I want to be that example for her so that she can also, you know, make a contribution that's positive. And Indigenous worldviews are very similar. To if you have something, you would give back, right? And I feel like Van City has similar values and I just really want to put our money where it might help somebody. Van City puts so much of their lending back into the hands of businesses that actually make a change. I think Van City is definitely trying to build relationships that are sustainable and real. We're looking for financial institutes like Van City that understand the economics, that understand the tremendous benefit and helps us both help the climate. When she grows up, she can say, my mom's standing for something and I should too. I just want to see my community thrive. We now have 15 minutes for questions related to the board and CEO reports. For this portion, we will have Scott Birchall, our Vice President of Communications and Stakeholder Relations, moderate your questions. Scott, over to you. Thank you, Nita. Uh, and welcome from uh, me to all our members who've joined us tonight. Please submit your questions now through the messaging icon, and we'll do our very best to get through the questions that you submit. But if we don't get to them, uh, please stay tuned in. There will be another question period later this evening. As a reminder, if you have a specific question related to your own financial accounts, we don't deal with those here at the AGM, but um, we encourage you to email us at agm at vancity.com, and we'll make sure your question gets to the right department and someone reaches out. 
So we've already had a few questions come in during the meeting, uh, and so we'll we'll go to those right now. Our first question is from Addie. Uh, what are your specific tangible actions towards anti-racism? Do you utilize outside anti-racism diversity consulting led by uh, BIPOC folks? How do you combat anti-blackness with no black representation on the board or upper leadership? Uh, maybe Christine, you want to start with this? Sure. Uh, thank you very much for the question, Adi, um, and fair questions. So yes, we did engage with um, an external uh, consultant that did have BIPOC representation to do our external equity audit. So this was an audit that we uh, you know, wanted to do to see what else we could be changing within our internal systems at Van City. And so we have uh, quite a few tangible actions. I, I would say the first, we did hire a chief equity and people officer. It was a recommendation from that audit in order to think more broadly about um, equity across our organization, both in our HR processes, but also in areas like credit and how do we think about marketing? How do we think about our community investment work? And so each of those areas is now undertaking additional steps. Um, so for example, our marketing group does also consult with um, other BIPOC external consultants to help us with that work. So while you're correct, we don't have any black representation um, at the executive team level or at the board level, um, we are taking a lot of those specific actions looking even at our credit policies. And maybe the final thing I'll just add on to that is we've also been uh, very involved in the Black Entrepreneurship Loan Fund that was put together last year. And we're really delighted to be part of that, trying to really think through um, who is getting financed? Do we know that what we finance and who we finance really matters? And so we're uh, really delighted to be part of that program um, with a lot more tangible actions to come. So thanks for the question. Our next question is uh, from Martin. And Martin is asking about the change to patronage that uh, was announced this year. The board's report did not include any mention of how the board has decided to discontinue patronage dividends. Would you please explain this to the members? Yes, thank you very much. You know, Van City shares 30% of its net profits every year through our shared success program. It's part of what makes us so different than other financial institutions. We split the 30% between members and community impact initiatives. And since 1994, we've shared more than $406 million. So we're making changes to the shared success program so that starting in 2023, it's more equitable. We're discontinuing the patronage part of the program in 2023 to focus more on membership dividend and our community initiatives. Because the patronage program was dependent on retail products that each member had with us, it disproportionately favored members who have higher accumulated wealth. So the changes for next year are being implemented based on our members' feedback, calling on us to continue to support groups in our communities and to advance the causes that matter most to our members. Due to the strength of our credit union, we're gonna be distributing almost $32 million back to members and community this year alone. And community investments will be targeting programs in support of financial inclusion, reconciliation, and anti-racism work. So the next question is from Craig. Uh, Craig is asking about our digital offerings. Uh, his question is, in the presentation so far and in the annual report, I did not hear any news on digital product development. Is there any news to report on developing new digital products to enhance the member experience? Uh, maybe Christine. Thanks for the question, Craig. Uh, so yes, um, that's a fair point. We didn't touch on it in great deal, but we are certainly constantly thinking about our overall digital roadmap and the team's working hard to execute on it. So a few things that uh, we do have our road on our roadmap that I know has been asked at previous AGMs. Uh, we do have Google Pay uh, on the list for later this year, or hopefully later this year. Um, and we're also, uh, we have things like Visa Debit is on our roadmap, and we're also looking at enhancements. Um, we know we get many comments in terms of our app, 
um, and some of our online banking um, tools. So those pieces are, of course, part of system-wide network. That's how our app um, was developed in the past. Is how we work on it now. So we do um, have an overall digital roadmap, and we're working to make sure that those improvements come out uh, for all of our members. Great. Our next question is from John. Uh, John's question is regarding one of our branches, Branch uh, 22 on the 4500 block West 10th Avenue, ceased to function as a storefront operation two years ago. When was the product, uh, property sold or leased? And is it, it's only in the last two months or so that modifications to the space began? Yes, I'm just trying to run through the branch numbers in my mind. Is it th that point gray? West 10th, West 10th, 10th so. is a point gray branch. Yes. So, um, so yes, uh, almost a year and a half ago or so, we had uh, looked at our overall branch network and um, decided on closing a few and then repositioning a few of our others and then looking at opening new ones, so our overall branch strategy. I can't speak specifically um, at the moment with respect to modifications to the space or what's happening with that specific location if others are taking that on. But certainly, um, I think it's a good opportunity with the question to talk about our overall branch footprint and our, and our network. You know, it's an extremely important part of Van City and we have been making changes. Um, the point gray one as an example. But we're also opening new ones. So we did open a new um, storefront, uh, to use your language, um, up at UBC, um, uh, what's the, um, Westbrook, thank you. Um, and we're looking at other locations as well. So um, I can't speak specifically to this, your question on modifications, but that would be the answer on our branches overall. Great. So our next question uh, is not a question, it's a comment. Uh, I'll just read it out. Thank, this is from Min. Thank you for addressing systemic racism. Wasn't expecting this, and I'm very glad it's being discussed. Uh, thank you for that, Min. And we have another question, uh, this one from Karim. With inflation such a concern, what is Van City doing to be a living wage employer? Yes, thanks for the question, Kareem. So we are a living wage employer, so that continues. And so every year we adjust um, based on living wage, you know, what that wage is. So we are that employer. But to answer the broader question, you know, we're very aware of the current environment and inflationary pressures. And um, we've been looking at that uh, as an employer. And, you know, we've indicated to our employees that we'll be coming back with some announcements on what we're going to be doing to try to help with that current inflationary environment. Great. Our next question is from Louise. I'm wondering why Van City, although very financially successful, has term deposit rates much lower than other BC credit unions and has done so for many years. Seems unfair. Yeah, thanks for the question, Louise. So I guess it's a bit difficult. We have many different term deposits, and I have heard that at times some of our members feel that the rates are lower in comparison, but there are many comparators, and we're constantly doing our best to again, look at what's in the market, what we can offer our members and when we need to adjust. The current environment is such that interest rates are changing quite quickly. And so we are adjusting and will continue to do so. Thank you. Great. So Marilyn is our next question. What are you doing to help those who are the most economically vulnerable in our province, including issues such as housing, education, mental health, racism, and the effects of climate emergencies? Thanks for the question. So I will begin to answer and then I would really, if you know, for more details, you can look at our annual report where we really outline um, a lot more detail on actually pretty much all of those topics. So certainly on housing and affordability, we, um, you know, we do a lot through our community investment work and through shared success to support organizations. One um, specific example is our housing accelerator fund where we look to do pre-construction work with not-for-profits who you know, have the ability to then pull more affordable housing units into place. So we've also financed quite a few co-ops and other affordable housing um, buildings. Uh, education, mental health, racism, and the effects of climate emergency. So again, those are a lot. So maybe I'll simply uh, speak a little bit more to climate since we already spoke about um, anti-racism. So in the same vein, we do quite a bit through shared success through our community investment work, and especially with climate, um, doing as much as we can with our own products and services. So we do have our planet-wise products 
We're looking at additional training to help our own teams be able to speak with members about what else members can be doing to, um, to change their own carbon footprint. And then we support many organizations in the communities that are also looking at climate justice and really how else we can think about dropping emissions overall. And obviously with our own um, target of dropping net to net zero for our financed emissions, we have a lot of work to do uh, to continue with that work. So thank you for the question and I hope you can find more details in our annual report. Great. Uh, Christopher is our next question. Will transfers to external financial institutions be offered in the future? If not, why? I, I think this question is referring to something other than the e-transfers, which members can also do, but maybe Christine, you wanna? I'm, I will try to answer the question, and if I don't, please provide a new question that uh, gives a bit more detail. But if you mean transfers to external financial institutions in terms of transferring your account um, or your funds, so you are certainly able to transfer to other financial institutions. If you're speaking more broadly about um, open banking and what that might mean in terms of financial institutions, then we are certainly working um, as part of our technology roadmap to ensure that, that we are prepared for that. Hopefully that answered your question. Yeah, and if, if that's not what you were asking, uh, Christopher, you could submit another question. Um, hi, Bing is our next uh, question. Is Van City involved in any initiatives to support some of the smaller communities that have been hit by the pandemic, like Chinatown, which has been largely ignored by the government because it's not a cool tourist spot like Granville Island? Thanks for the question. We certainly do our best to support many smaller communities and many underserved groups. Um, you know, as an example, keeping Pigeon Park opened in the downtown east side throughout the pandemic, you know, just to, to give you an example. And through our community investment team, we're certainly always providing funding to various groups. Um, Specifically with Chinatown, we certainly have worked uh, for decades in that area and continue to look to provide uh, support as we can. Okay, great. And uh, that is our last question at this question period. We're now at time. Uh, so, Anita, I'll uh, send it back to you. Thank you, Scott. I now call on Van City's Audit Committee Chair, Director Bill Chan, to present the Auditor's Report and Sustainability Assurance Providers Report on behalf of KPMG. Thank you, Anita. Good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us tonight. KPMG LLP was appointed as the external auditor of the credit union for the year ended December 31st, 2021. KPMG was engaged by the credit union to, to perform an audit of the annual consolidated financial statements of Van City for the year ended December 31st, 2021 which is a regulatory requirement for all credit unions in British Columbia and to provide assurance over key accountability data, information and principles included in the 2021 annual report. The assurance provided over Van City's accountability reporting is not a legal or regulatory requirement, but one that management and the board have voluntarily sought to obtain as leading best practice here in Canada and globally. One firm, KPMG, provides assurance over both the financial statements and key accountability information and principles in the annual report. The external assurance provides confidence that key information is complete, accurate, and balanced. It also drives improvements and in integration in credit unions management and reporting practices. KPMG's independent auditors report over the 2021 consolidated financial statements is included in the 2021 annual report on page 56. KPMG's independent assurance report over Van City's accountability report reporting is included in the 2021 annual report on page 54 to 55. There are no concerns to discuss with you with respect to the reports provided by KPMG. The Audit Committee has reviewed the work performed by KPMG and confirms that KPMG has remained independent from Van City in the context of the rules established under professional standards, received the full cooperation of management and employees of Van City in conducting their audits, 
being provided with full access to Van City's books and records during their audits and being able to carry out our audit procedures without any restrictions or limitations. I move that external auditors report and the sustainability assurance providers report for the year ended December 31st, 2021 be adopted. Thank you, Bill. You should see the motion on your screen to adopt the external auditors report and the sustainability assurance providers report. Please click on the messaging icon if you'd like to second this motion. So we're looking for someone, one of our members virtually to second the motion, please. Is there somebody um, who's with us online who would like to second the motion that Director Bill Chan has just moved? Yes, we have a seconder. Rachel, thank you very much. Uh, the motion has been moved and seconded. Is there any discussion? I'll wait a few moments for any of you who are typing. I'm being informed that there's no discussion taking place online. The question is, should the external auditors report and the sustainability assurance providers report for the year ended December 31st, 2021 be adopted? Please vote now. My name is Aliyah Sunderji and I'm the founder of Love the Grub. I'm also a sustainable innovation lecturer at Simon Fraser University and Radius SFU. I'm a mom, I'm a community member, I'm a daughter, I'm a partner. At Love the Grub, we take bumped, bruised, misshapen fruits and vegetables. Um, we rescue them from our partner farms and produce markets um, in an effort to avoid them from going into the landfill. And we turn them into chutneys and spreads um, to sell for the local market. I wanted to also make an impact on the socioeconomic side of things. And I uh, hire newcomer refugees because my mom is a refugee, my partner is a refugee, and I really wanted to give back to that community. I'm trying to be as bold and standing up for what I believe in and being passionate. I want to be that example for her so that she can also you know, make a contribution that's positive. When she grows up, she can say, my mom's standing for something and I should too. People will tell you it's impossible, that things will never change. Well, to them we say, just watch. Because with every dollar you borrow, every cent you invest, every tap, every swipe, you join a movement. One that knows the climate crisis can be solved. That's proof sustainable is profitable. One that makes room for everyone and believes that when you use your money to do what's right, nothing can stop us. That's when you become a financial force for change. The results of the motion are in, and the motion is carried. You will now see our second motion on the screen. I move that KPMG LLP be appointed Auditor and Sustainability Assurance Provider for Van City for 2022, and that the Board of Directors be authorized to set the remuneration for KPMG in this capacity. Once again, Please type in the chat if you would like to second this motion. 
So friends, we're looking for a seconder for the motion. Here we go. Thank you, James. So we have a seconder uh, for the motion. Is there discussion? I don't believe that there's any discussion taking place online. So the question is, should KPMG be appointed auditor and sustainability assurance provider for Van City for 2022 with the board directors authorized to set the remuneration for KPMG. Thanks, Bill. Colleagues and friends online, please vote now. My name's Mike Williamson and I'm president and CEO of Cascadia Seaweed and I'm one of the three founding partners. Cascadia Seaweed is growing to be the largest ocean cultivator of seaweed in North America. In the next 25 years, 10% of the global food mass should come from seaweed. And as the seaweed sector grows, it produces very positive uh, ecosystem services. It sequesters carbon, it uptakes excess nutrients, it reduces acidification, and it creates habitat for things that live in the ocean. Folks are finally realizing we've got to do more to save the climate and to improve our environment. Seaweed can have a positive economic and environmental impact. We're looking for financial institutes like Van City that understand the economics, that understand the tremendous benefit and helps us both help the climate. The answer is that the motion is carried. Thank you, Bill. We will now hear from Director Lily Grewal, Chair of the Nominations and Elections Committee. Thank you, Anita. Good evening, members. The members of the Nominations and Elections Committee for 20, 2022 are the following non-director members, Lori Charvet, Kevin Huang, Mira Oric, and Sam Otum. And the director members were Christy Stevenson and myself as chair. Hello to our nominations and elections committee members who have joined us online tonight virtually and a warm thank you to all of you for all of your efforts. So this year we had six candidates running for our four positions on the board and we had 26,391 ballot ballots cast this year. That includes both online and by mail. As a result, Three of our candidates were elected as directors. Three of our candidates that were elected as directors will be serving a three-year term, with the fourth serving a two-year term, commencing at the end of the close of this AGM. The following directors have been elected to serve a three-year term. Kristen Rivers, who received 20,443 votes. Rita Parikh, who received 20,104 votes and Patrick Nango, who received 18,376 votes. And the fourth director elected to serve for the last two years remaining of Javaria Velkamp's term is Joel DeYoung with 16,344 votes. Congratulations to all of you. On behalf of all Van City members, thank you to all of the candidates who ran this year's election for board of directors. Without members like you, we would not be the strong and democratic cooperative that we are. You all are great examples of our passionate and engaged membership. And I would like to recognize each one of you tonight. So thank you again, Joel, Shahaji Matthew, Patrick Nangle, Rita Parikh, 
Paul Plater, and Christian Rivers. The next item on our agenda is board director remuneration. Board director remuneration is reviewed every three years by an independent committee of members. The director remuneration committee is comprised of three Van City members who are not serving as directors of Van City or any of Van City's subsidiaries or affiliates. In 2021, the governance committee undertook a review of director remuneration and a director remuneration committee was appointed consisting of three independent members at large in September who represented experience in compensation matters or in human resources, particularly within values-based organizations, understanding of Van City's mission and values and cooperatives in general, experience serving on a board or reporting to a board, understanding any of the following, governance, finance, industry and risk management, demonstrated community leadership, demonstrated decision-making ability, strong communication skills, effective judgment, respect for others, integrity, and listening skills. They are Patty Shaw Moffat, Principal and Chief Strategist, PSM Ventures, Inc. Phil Bowden, Board Director, The Cooperators Insurance Group. Ashley Dollywall, Senior Manager, Benefits and Operations, Lululemon. I'd now like to introduce Patty Shaw Moffat, the Chair of the Remuneration Committee, to present the committee's recommendations. Thank you, Anita. Um, I'm Patty Shaw Moffat, and next year I get to celebrate being a Van City member for 40 years. Um, Phil and Ashley and I worked well together. We met on numerous occasions. We looked at the job description of the board of directors. We looked at Van City's mission. We looked at remuneration of similar organizations, comparable, and we looked at a history of the compensation of the board. And when we were considering what the compensation should be, there were a number of factors we wanted to take into consideration. The first was we were quite aware that, you know, we were in the midst of COVID, and while Van City's performance was good, we knew that individual members, many of them had been adversely affected by COVID, and we wanted to be responsible and just acknowledge that not everybody was doing well and we wanted to take a prudent approach. We also wanted con to consider board compensation as something different than employment income. So we weren't looking at uh, the same kind of conditions we would look at if we were hiring an employee because we felt that the board members joined Van City as a volunteer to add value but we did need to compensate them for because what we were asking them to do was both a lot of responsibility and a lot of a time commitment and they deserve compensation. We wanted to provide a percentage increase. In the past, there had been increases that were tied to cost of living, et cetera, but we felt that if we gave a percentage increase, the board would be able to know what their remuneration was going to be over the, threat, over the next three years, and the organization, Van City, would know what uh, they needed to pay. And finally, when we looked at the remuneration, we felt that the um, responsibilities of the board chair were quite significant and more significant than what the board members did. And when we looked at the compensation, we felt that there wasn't enough of a difference between a board member and the chair. And so we looked at the board chair uh, remuneration slightly differently. And what I'd like to do is talk to you about what we arrived at. Um, we are recommending a 6.12% increase over three years. So it's a 2% increase each year. And that would take a board member from $50,160 in remuneration to $53,230 at the end of the uh, three years. The committee chairs, same uh, percentage of remuneration, 6.12%, and they would go from 58,462 to 62,040 because the committee chairs <clears throat> receive slightly higher remuneration than a board member without a chair responsibility. For the board chair, we recommended a 10.87% increase over three years, 3.5% per year, and that remuneration would go from 79,479 to 88,120. Uh, we made these um, recommendations and we presented them, and these are the recommendations of the committee. They have not been changed. 
Thank you, Patty. As this motion is presented by a committee duly appointed to review the remuneration at the instruction of the membership, it doesn't require a seconder. Are there any questions for the independent committee? I will provide a few minutes for you to type them in the chat room and we'll enjoy a video in the interim. We won't enjoy a video in the interim. We're, we're waiting for your questions. Please send them in if you've got them. Pigeon Park Savings is a low barrier, community oriented credit union. For a lot of people, Pigeon Park is the last option in banking and check cashing. Folks who often can't access uh, banking services elsewhere or have been left out of financial services who feel that they're inaccessible. There are a lot of resources that are needed by folks that can't access them in other ways. So we help our members access basic financial literacy, cashing your check, getting a bank card. If it wasn't for them, a lot of people would not be able to get their welfare checks or their CPP checks. There's no other bank in the downtown east side that gives you that type of respect and gratitude. It's a welcoming atmosphere, like there's no judgment from anyone. They bend over backwards for me and I just, I appreciate it more than I can say. To be able to come in here, get an account and have a bank card, it, it, it really helps a lot of people. I see it in their faces, I see it in the way they act. During COVID, they have been there for the neighborhood, they've been there for me. And what's important is they treat people with respect. To take away our services would mean we would leave people without money. Like, we have members who only come in to the branch. We would really try to get folks on direct deposit so that they can kind of have their money automatically come into their account. We don't have online banking, we don't have telephone banking, we don't have credit cards. The two other options that I would have had would basically taking a ministry check to the bank and uh, hopefully have ID at the time or to Money Mart and give away half the check and service fees. Just being that one yes in someone's day full of no's, that's what we strive to do. So. Thank you. We have um, questions, and like before, I'm going to ask Scott to please moderate for us. Thanks, Nita. So uh, we, we have a question from Deborah, and her question is, how is it a volunteer position uh, is remunerated at all? is what we ask board members to do and the hours they spend, we are not remunerating them on an hour by hour basis. We are asking them to make a commitment to uh, do the work, the, uh, be responsible and put a tremendous amount of time in. And for that, there is, I would, I think of it as an honorarium. It's not, you know, you pay so many hours and this is what you earn per hour. And so in that way, a lot of the work that a board member does is volunteer because the compensation we're giving them in no way is, is equivocal to how much work they put in. So the next question is from Melissa. Um, why is there such a vast difference in the wage increase for the board of directors compared to your frontline staff? I can't speak to frontline staff. We weren't asked to look at that. What we were asked to do is specifically look at compensation for the board of directors and what we thought would be fair. We looked at comparables for other organizations like ours and we wanted our uh, board to be in the sort of top 25%, but certainly not at the top. But the compensation for staff was well outside our remit. 
Okay, great. Thank you, Patty. Um, Anita, that's, uh, we have no other questions, so we'll turn it back to you. Thanks, Scott, and thank you, Patty. We will now move to the ordinary resolution that will need to be approved for the Remuneration Committee's recommendation to come into effect. The resolution is in your AGM package and also on the screen for you to review, and it states, resolved that the Van City Board of Directors remuneration be approved, be it further resolved that a 2% increase for directors per year for three years, total dollar increase of $3,070 over 2021 remuneration be approved and implemented, be it further resolved that a 2% increase for committee chairs be per year for three years, total dollar increase of $3,578 over 2021 remuneration be approved and implemented, and be it further resolved that 3.5% increase for board share per year for three years, total dollar increase of $8,641 over 2021 remuneration be approved and implemented. The question is, should the Van City Board of Directors remuneration resolution be approved? Once again, the resolution is in your AGM package. Please vote now. Pigeon Park Savings is a low barrier, community oriented credit union. For a lot of people, Pigeon Park is the last option in banking and check cashing. Folks who often can't access uh, banking services elsewhere or have been left out of financial services who feel that they're inaccessible. There are a lot of resources that are needed by folks that can't access them in other ways. So we help our members access basic financial literacy, cashing your check, getting a bank card. If it wasn't for them, a lot of people would not be able to get their welfare checks or their CPP checks. There's no other bank in the downtown east side that gives you that type of respect and gratitude. It's a welcoming atmosphere, like there's no judgment from anyone. They bend over backwards for me and I just, I appreciate it more than I can say. To be able to come in here, get an account and have a bank card, it, it, it really helps a lot of people. I see it in their faces, I see it in the way they act. During COVID, they have been there for the neighborhood, they've been there for me. And what's important is they treat people with respect. To take away our services would mean we would leave people without money. Like, we have members who only come in to the branch. We would really try to get folks on direct deposit so that they can kind of have their money automatically come into their account. We don't have online banking, we don't have telephone banking, we don't have credit cards. The two other options that I would have had would basically taking a ministry check to the bank and uh, hopefully have ID at the time or to Money Mart and give away half the check and service fees. Just being that one yes in someone's day full of no's, that's what we strive to do. So. The, the results of the votes are in, and the motion is carried. Thank you, Patty, Ashley, and Phil, for all of your work on behalf of the board and Van City members. We'll now proceed to the question period. We have 15 minutes for questions, including new business. And I will once again hand it over to Scott to help us moderate this portion of the meeting. Thanks, Anita. Once again, if um, you please submit your questions through the chat now. As a reminder, if we don't get to your question tonight, we will collect all the outstanding questions and we will post uh, answers to those based on the theme of the questions that we received during the webcast. Those responses will be posted on bandcity.com uh, in the days following the meeting. So we have, uh, we have some questions. The first question is from Andrew. 
I think the person who asked about transfers to other institutions is meaning the so-called me-to-me transfers offered by credit unions in Ontario and Manitoba and online banks such as Canadian Tire, Simply and Tangerine. Um, that is a very nice clarification of another member's question. <laughs> Christine, you want to? Uh, yeah, thanks for the, the clarification. Um, I think that's something we'll, we'll need to get back to you on that specifically because I'm, I'm not, I don't have broader context to, to provide. But we'll get back to you. Okay, great. Uh, the next question is from Kelvin. Kelvin is asking, uh, do the board have other full-time commitments and can there be conflicts of interest? Anita, you want to explain? Yes, I do want to answer that. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, Kelvin, for the question. So the answer to the first part about whether the board have other full-time commitments is that it depends on the director. Many of the directors that are here with me this evening and that are participating virtually, yes, they do have other full-time commitments. Um, I, for instance, was a practicing lawyer uh, until recently. I've now gone to non-practicing status, um, and I have other board commitments. Can there be conflicts of interest? Yes, there can be. And we have policies that specifically spell out how we deal with conflicts of interest. We have a governance department with a corporate secretary and general counsel and governance senior advisors, among others who give us advice about how we ought to handle conflicts of interest in order to be sure that when conflicts arise, they're fully disclosed and dealt with appropriately. Great. Uh, we have a uh, question from uh, Andrea or Andrea. I'm not sure how you choose to pronounce your name, so I hope I got it right. Um, what steps are the executive committee and the board undertaking to proceed in advancing representation of IBPOC persons at both senior leadership and board levels? Um, it's probably an answer for, for each of you. Mm -hmm. Sure, Christine. I'll start. Uh, thanks. I believe it's Andrea, um, if it's the person I think. So hello. Um, we, uh, we certainly are taking many steps. And I think what I would say in terms of overall representation is we are looking at our overall talent pipeline. So the senior leadership, so there is the executive team, of course, and then we have a broad senior leadership team um, that we include as our directors of vice presidents um, and then the executive team as well. And so we have been working hard to look at representation across the board. We've also signed on to various initiatives, um, 5030 and Black North, because we, we want to be held to account. So we have been looking at that, and part of that is including broader leadership development and talent pipeline throughout the organization. Um, a lot uh, of our, a lot of positions that we fill are done through internal talent. And so we really want to ensure that we're providing better access, um, better training, better mentorship. And so we're working on all of those elements to increase the representation. So thanks for the question. Thanks, Christine. Uh, Andrea, thanks. And uh, hello to you as well. Um, thank you for this question. Uh, I said earlier in my report that um, the board takes anti-racism very, very seriously, and it actually is one of our express board goals. And I'm happy to tell you that among other initiatives, we actually worked with an external consultant in order to give us advice about how we can improve our governance to be expressly anti-racist. We have the results of that report with management. We then, through our governance committee, adopted a series of steps that we're gonna take to become expressly anti-racist. But I wanna also talk about the diversity on the board. And I, I wanna say that I'm extremely proud of our members who elect such a diverse board. Uh, we have, I think, one of the most diverse boards in Canada, and we're proud of that. Uh, it's unique that in credit unions, as opposed to other financial institutions in Canada, our members elect us. And we are fortunate to have the diverse um, board members that you see in front of you representing, I hope, many, many of our communities in British Columbia. Thanks for the question. Great. Um, the next question is, uh, again, not a question, but a comment, and uh, I'll just read it out. It's from Jonathan. I want to give a huge thanks to Van City, and in particular, Tiffany Odehall, Community Investment Portfolio Manager for Labor Partners, 
The support of Ann City to our cooperative development through the Union Cooperative Initiative in partnership with the ACWU and IATSE has been so integral in helping get our worker cooperatives off the ground in Vancouver. These jobs have been life-changing for our members, and Van City's support resulted in their first paychecks during the hardest times of the pandemic. Thank you. Um, thank you, Jonathan. We really appreciate that. Uh, the next question is from John. Since the Point Grey and Dunbar branches were closed to members in early 2020, only four Van City branches remain west of Granville Street, leaving large parts of Vancouver far from a branch for personal services. This doesn't appear to be equitable for residents in this area. Um, so again, I guess, Christine. Mm -hmm. Thanks for the question, John. And certainly appreciate that uh, at times that may feel uh, or is inconvenient. When we looked at our branch network, you know, we do look at overall membership. We look at patterns. We look at how our members are using our services. And what we've seen over the years is a huge shift, um, certainly away from in-person to online and to phone. So we have been trying to adjust and to shift our resources appropriately. It isn't, however, about simply shutting branches. We are absolutely committed to our branch network. We have actually the same number of branches as we did several years ago, but we have been moving, adjusting and opening new ones in new areas. So again, we did uh, open a new one up at UBC. We will be continuing to look at other areas. We have another one uh, in North Vancouver that will be reopening. I recognize this is not where you live, um, but we are looking at a lot of other regions um, and, and using the data to ensure that we are being equitable across our membership. Thanks for the question. And I, I think you answered uh, the next question, which was, do you have plans to expand uh, branches? But I think you've covered that. Yes. Our next question is from Kelvin. Is there a way for members to review a list of organizations and programs where shared success or Van City Community Foundation uh, are paid to? Um, they mean the funding. It would help us know what percent of resources are provided to each segment of social equity needs. Christine? Thanks for the question. Um, I'm trying to think about whether we actually do provide this list. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think what I would say is that certainly we try to be very transparent in all of our work, including through our annual reports um, and certainly online as we try to provide stories of where our funding is going towards. Um, I think we also do try to provide percentages broadly in terms of the impact areas that we've been supporting um, and certainly tried to list some of those even in the, uh, C my CEO report this evening. But the actual specifics of the organizations and programs, uh, we can certainly take that away and, and think about uh, the pros and cons of putting that um, online or something. Thank you. Uh, next question is from Zachary. What pay rises are being provided to employees below the executive level in line with the board director remuneration rise? Thanks for the question. Uh, what I would say overall about pay is that we uh, do this on an annual basis, Advanced City, we certainly uh, care greatly about the financial well-being of our employees. So we start first as a living wage employer, we then look at annual uh, cost of living and merit increases, we do that every year in January. Uh, we also provide a lot more broadly what we call total rewards that, you know, to specifically to your question, don't apply to the board. So we have uh, very generous benefits, we offer either a group RSP or defined benefit uh, pension plan uh, to our employees um, and more, along with many uh, smaller perks and many resources that we hope our employees use for mental health and the like. And then specifically with respect to looking at the, the current external environment, inflationary pressures, you know, as I said in the first question period, we are looking at that. We've told our employees that we're looking at that. We're going to be coming out uh, soon with um, some adjustments for that. So. Um, they're not looked at exactly in a, a comparable way, but every year we certainly provide our employees with um, additional increases. And last year, uh, given that we did have such a strong increase, in addition to profit share, which all of our employees receive, we also gave um, a one-time additional 2% to our employees. So we feel that uh, we're doing our best to be as equitable as we can um, across our employee base. And I think we have time for uh, one more question, and then that will be the end of the question period. So our question is from Min. Uh, there have been several articles published in the past few months regarding the increase in food and housing insecurity as prices and expenses, like rent, continue to surge and wages stay the same. I'm wondering if Van City has any initiatives to address this increasing social issue. 
Yeah, thanks for the question. You're right. Um, there's been a lot published, and we know that there are increases in, in food and housing insecurity. Um, and certainly there isn't one quick fix, and you know we do our best to be part of the solution, but certainly it takes more than Van City as well. So what we do try to do as much as possible, and again, mainly through our community investment team, but also through with all of our, member, um, our frontline staff, is really working individually with members as much as we can to help alleviate and, again, as much as we can, the situation. Through our community investment work, we provide significant resources to many different organizations that are looking at food insecurity. Um, and as I mentioned in the earlier question period, a lot with respect to affordable housing and really doing our best to help support as many new units of affordable housing as we can. And that's either through um, our foundation, through our, our regular lines of business and working with many community partners that are doing their best. So I appreciate that it is a very uh, complex situation. We do what we can and certainly work with others um, because it is a system issue. And so we do look at how we can be part of system solutions. Thank you. Great. And uh, just before we sign off on the questions, there we have uh, just one clarification, which was regarding uh, the posting of our uh, shared success uh, grants uh, to the grantees and where that information is. It is in fact posted online and it's available now. You can see the 2021 shared success grant list uh, there. So uh, that's, that's uh, our question period coming to an end. And so Anita, we'll, we'll throw it back to you. Thanks, Scott. And thank you to our members for all your thoughtful questions tonight. We welcome your feedback, so feel free to send us an email at agm at vancity.com. If you'd like to get in touch with Vancity's board, you can email us at board underscore directors at vancity.com. This completes the business aspect of the AGM. I'd like to take a minute to thank all of our staff who made this virtual meeting possible. You know, Vancity's governance team, the communications team, and the marketing team who have all put in a lot of time and effort in ensuring we can connect with all of you virtually tonight. And also thank you to our venue host, the Rocky Mountaineer Station, our ASL interpreters, our two audiovisual teams, Encore and Showmax, and our voting platform provider, Lumi, for your technical support in ensuring tonight's webcast ran smoothly. Thank you to everyone who joined us tonight and stayed with us throughout the meeting. Without you, this meeting would not have been possible. We look forward to seeing you again soon. Good night.